Good enough. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Sorry about that. Whew. Okay, so the Earth, it's not flat. It's also not a sphere. Okay, uh, it's a lot more complicated than that. I'm going to race through this because I normally have a lot more time for this talk. You'll just have to believe me on some of this stuff. The Earth spins, it's fatter in the middle. Beyond that, that's like level, th level three understanding. It's not flat, it's not round, okay? It's also not even ellipsoid because there's like different densities in the Earth and things pull on the crust in different ways and stuff. So the upshot of all this is that it's really hard to give a location on Earth in like a standard way. The way most of us are used to it is GPS lap logs, right? This is what you get in your car, um, any GPS system. And it's a pretty good system. Choose a center point. That center point will actually move around depending on the model you're using because, again, not exactly spherical and stuff. But take that, draw one angle out from the meridian. That's the thing that runs through the middle of London. Draw another one up from the equator and draw a line out to where it intersects with the model of the Earth. And that's a point that you've got on the ground. Okay, that works pretty well, except as you go further north, one of the longitude degrees changes how much distance you move. That makes the math hard there. You can kind of see it here. The, the squares get closer together, right? So there's also two types of primary data, uh, spatial data that we work with. I, I forgot to say this, but way back in the midst of time, I got a degree, a master's degree in geographical information systems, and I used to work in that for five years, and it didn't look like that was going anywhere. I took a career change, and then just recently, last three years or so, it picked up again, and I started doing it, and the, 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 the discipline hasn't changed much, but the tools and the languages have, and it's wonderful what you can do now. So two primary types of spatial data, there's raster and vector. Vector is what you get on your GPS, again, lat longs, draw lines in between, fill them in with colors, and get a nice scalable map. It's like SVG. Raster is like an image, okay? It, it has this assumption that all the pixels are the same size. And that's the problem. If you go back here, you can pretty much see these pixels aren't really the same size, right, as you move around. So why does all this matter? It matters because we have loads of different ways of taking something that's round, like the Earth, and squashing it flat to put, uh, or to make data processable in 2D. And that's really what we're aiming for. There's all these different things, uh, conical projections, there's polar projections, this one, uh, this is a conical one. The, the other one besides uh, lat longs, or WGS84, that we deal with a lot, is this thing called a universal transverse Mercator. It's a cylinder that wraps around the Earth, and there's like 60 of these that go around the Earth. They change every six degrees, and you kind of squish it out and then open it up again, and it makes something approximately meter-based and flat. This is the US, and in the mainland, lower 48, there are nine, uh, there are nine different UTM zones that cover it. Okay, right, this is not a talk just on UTMs or CRSs, but what I do want you to take away is what happens when you get the CRS wrong. And this is the key to this talk, okay? This is a field in UTM zone 15. It's defined and you can see that it's a field, right? It's the outline of a field. If I get the wrong CRS, I don't know if you can see it, but down here, that's that field and it's now in the middle of Lake Erie. Okay, and that's the worst possible outcome. We didn't get an error, we didn't get no data, we got a bunch of water where there should be a field. And now if you try and process that, you may not even detect it. If you're doing massive scale, right, you're not gonna go and check every field that you process, and you've just given out the wrong results. Some farmer somewhere is scratching their head going, why are they saying there's too much water in this field? So, so what does most code do? Most code up until now, the state of the art, is lots and lots of redundant coordinate reference system checks. You make sure that the coordinate reference systems are the same, or as expected, when you, when you use them. And it looks a lot like this. You'd have some kind of thing that says ensure the same CRS, and here's our two CRSs, and we do some kind of comparison against them, and we throw an exception if they're wrong. And we rely on those runtime checks to 
make sure everything's working. Now, this is where I think it gets interesting, because this is where Scala's type system, which wasn't really available to me when I was doing this stuff before, really kicks in. Scala has this concept of variance between uh, types and subtypes, and a greatly underestimated variance is invariant. Okay, everybody talks about covariant and contravariant. I really like invariant, because with invariant, any type parameter changes the overall type and makes it a completely different type in the system. So, an example of this is set, okay? Set of int and set of string are, by Scala's compiler standards, completely different types. They have nothing in common, okay? You cannot, that you can't pass a set of int into something that expects a set of any. It's not covariant, it's invariant, it's a different type. So this is not a talk on variance, but what you really need to know is that list is covariant. If you have something that says, I'll take a list of any, you can pass it any kind of list, and it works. With a set, set is invariant. If you, pass it, if you say it's a set of any, then what you pass it has to be a set of any. If you pass it anything else, it won't compile. OK, so given that, let's see what we can do with these CRSs to disambiguate them. Start with a uh, simple definition. I like case classes. I think they make an excellent basis for an API. Uh, I always start with case class if I can. So here's an abstract class, first of all. And this is going to be our coordinate reference system definition. It takes a CRS code and it does some kind of lookup. This, this mechanism, if you're interested, we use a, a library called GeoTools. It's an open source library. It has all the definitions for the standards, the EPSG standards, which is thousands of different CRSs. And you can bring the mathematical model in for them. So when you do this, there's actually a mathematical model which includes the datum, the projection, uh, all of the information that's needed to define that coordinate reference system. We can create a case class that extends this definition up here. Now you may be wondering why case class and not case object here, right? So that's the next bit. We need that case class and its companion so that we can do a bit of tricky stuff. I think this is maybe the first bit of real coding where you might say, oh, I didn't know you could do that. So here's the case class. It extends this EPSG4326. That's our lat longs. That's our WGS84. The object extends a companion. Uh, a, well, it's an it's a abstract class that is inten intended to be extended by companion objects. Okay? It's also a type class. Hopefully. Anyone not really not know about type classes? Do I need to do? I don't think there's going to be time. Type classes are cool. You should go look them up if you haven't already, OK? So this thing, CRS type, is a type class. It's a class with information about this type here. And specifically, it's the definition of that. By doing this, we can create this abstract class CRS type. That's what this extends. We can suck the type parameter into a type member. I love this trick. OK, we've taken something that the Scala compiler has said, this is the type that we've got, and we've shoved it into this instance. And now it lives in that instance, and the compiler can pull it out again later. Uh, there's an apply method on any companion object. And we know this, this apply method is going to produce a CRS def. So this is a abstract, but we know it's going to be there by some by some companion object that extends this, we'll get that. Since we've got that, we can call it and get the instance of our CRS definition. From that, we can pull out the actual coordinate reference system, the definitions. We can pull out an ID if we want to. And then I love this little trick right here. You might, might or might not have seen this before. So a companion object is a low priority. It's a place where you can check for low priority implicit definitions. Given some type here, EPSG4326, if there's some implicit that needs to apply to that, the companion object will always be searched for that. It'll be searched last, but it will look in there. By making this thing have a pointer back to itself and mark it, marking it as implicit, this companion object becomes its own implicit type class, OK? Because it's inside itself. 
First time I did that, I'm like, I did not know you could get away with that. I thought I was running away going, I got away with something. This is awesome. So this means what we've done now, we've created a definition. We've created the companion object for it. And these two things, this is now a type in the system. This is its companion object. And they're linked together. So what it means is we can do some things like this. I'm going to show you some of the some of the stuff that this gives you. Let's say we've got some kind of geometry type, a point or a polygon or something like that. This is now type parameterized by our CRS. And this is a context bound. If you haven't seen one of these, it's a way of using uh, type classes. It just means that for this type, there must be a CRS type definition available. Okay, so now we know we've got this CRS type definition. We can find a transform to some new CRS, okay? for which there is also a CRS type definition. We know we've got this definition. We know we've got this definition. We can return a math transform. This is all machinery so far. We haven't seen the type work yet. But what we know is that given this type and this type, we can find a, tr a mathematical transformation between them. Now we can do, OK, my coordinate is going to have some kind of CRS in it. It's going to extend a geometry type of that CRS. And down here, we're going to have a method called transform the CRS of that, of that coordinate. Now, what this does, it doesn't just do the calculation. It gives back a new type when we call it. So we say, take this point that I've got in EPSG 4326, transform the type to EPSG 32615. So that's a new type in the system, right? When it does that, it does the mathematical transform automatically. We control that. We make it do the transform before it gives it back. Now we have a coordinate in a different type, in a different CRS, and it's correct. Right, why does this matter? Because now the compiler has your back. All this machinery, it seems like a lot of work, but you only have to do it once. People using your API now get to say, I'm gonna show a map, and I'm only gonna, I'm only gonna accept coordinates in WGS84, or EPSG4326, right? If I try and give it a EPSG4326 coordinate, everything's fine. If, however, I try and give it a coordinate in UTM zone 10, it's a compile error now. It says you can't do that. That's the wrong CRS. So we just got rid of all our runtime CRSs, right? We don't have to do that check anymore. The compiler now tells us, you can't do that. That's the wrong CRS. So what we can do is for any CRS that doesn't conform, we have this handy transform CRS. We can transform it to the right type. It now compiles. So we've taken this whole like, group of runtime problems and turned them into compile time problems. And now you have to fix it before it will, it will actually compile. So you know it's correct. OK, so I am really racing through this, but there's a flaw here. The problem with the Scala type system, uh, which you very quickly learn, is that it only exists in one place, which is inside of the Scala compiler. The rest of the world doesn't give a damn about the Scala type system. Okay? So at some point, you have to bring stuff in, and at compile time, you can't see the future, so you don't know what a CRS is going to be. If you load in some data, it obviously has a CRS, but unless you're very lucky, you don't know that it's going to be WGS84. It could be NAD83. It could be some other CRS, right? So what we can do is introduce this idea of an existential type, okay? It's a type that there are some things I know. I know there's going to be a type here, first of all, some CRS. We'll call it, there's some CRS there. We know there's going to be a definition for it, because if it's a, if it's a, reasonable, I mean, it's a reasonable assumption that data you load in is going to have a conforming coordinate reference system. So we can read that data, and we can create a CRS type out of it. All we need is the definition. We can make that, that CRS type. We can put the definition in there, tie them together, so this sum CRS and this CRS type need to be defined. And this is your existential, uh, existential class. This is some CRS that we know is going to be there. We know we have a definition for, but we don't know what it is. This is one of the coolest things about Scala's type system. 
the ability to put path-dependent types inside of other instances of things and have them be completely new types in the type system. This is now, this is a real type in the Scala compiler. It's distinct from every other type in the Scala compiler. So we just invented a type, okay? And we can use it. It's not gonna match anything else yet, but we can transform it to whatever we need. So what we can do down here then is, you know, we look up these CRS definitions, however we do, there's some identifier in the file, or quite often there's like an actual model definition in there. We suck that in, we create the companion type, we create this, we invent this new type, and we say that's the type of this thing, here's the definition for it. And then, you'll notice, by the way, the type and the, and the value have the same name. There's a reason for that. What we can then do is import that type from the instance. So we've read this thing, we've created it, we've got this little packet of information that includes the type and the definition for it. If we import it, it suddenly comes in as a real thing, like we just we just not only invented this thing, but we just sucked it into the Scala compiler, and the definition that it needs, the implicit that it needs, came in with it, because it's got the same name. So now we can use this thing. We can say, well, I don't know what this CRS is, but I know it's a valid one. It has the implicit that it needs. So I can make coordinates in that. I can then transform them to any other CRS in the system. So now I've reified that into some type that I know. Hopefully this is like making sense and I haven't just rushed ahead so fast that everyone's at this point lost. But this is really cool. Not only that, maybe you don't want to convert it into a type you, you know. I mean, really, EPSG32615 is just some other type in the system. It means no more to us than this does. So maybe we go the other way. Maybe we take the things that we have from other sources and we just convert them to some CRS. That'll work as well. We can go either way, we can, these are just types. These are just types in the system. All right, there'll be time, hopefully time for questions at the end. I'm gonna go very quickly over Polygon, but basically this is using the same thing, transform CRS here, goes down to the coordinates, finds the transform for each coordinate, maps over those, and then creates a Polygon in the new CRS. So you see how this kind of composes and we can do transforms between uh, all of these different things. Now, what's, I, I think the thing that is worth mentioning here is that this code ends up running faster as well. The compiler has checked this stuff, so we don't have to do all these runtime checks anymore. This actually ends up speeding up the code. We pay a higher compile time cost, but we get faster and safer runtime. All right, the result of this is that the API is simple and it's really hard to get wrong. We create coordinates in some CRS, if we give it the wrong CRS, it immediately tells us in compile, in, in fact, the IDE actually tells us, I was expecting a 32615. You gave me a 32616. That's not going to work. You have to, you have to rectify that. And it doesn't take long for people to pick up on the, oh, yeah, I've got the wrong CRS. I'll just do a transform on that, and that will work. Right, so. OK, um, this one I thought was worth mentioning. The, Lat longs are angle based, they're, they're like angles, and asking for an, an area of an angle based CRS is kind of a weird thing to do. The area will actually change depending on the latitude of that thing because the, the pixel sizes change effectively. So what we could do is introduce the idea of an angle based and maybe some kind of length or meter based CRS, and we only allow areas to be calculated on this meter type. So we would then say an area in square meters, this depends on us having a meter CRS type definition. And now we can't pass 4326 in because that will give an, a compile time error. It says there's no evidence that this is a meter based CRS. So you can refine it, you can change the rules and make them more strict. All right, how am I doing for time horribly? All right, one last thing. This existential um, idea can be, once you, once you grasp it, once you've got the hang of it, can be used for a lot more. So one of the things that we end up working with is the raster data. Raster data rarely comes in WGS84 because it doesn't work well. Pixels aren't the same size. 
So all of those UTM zones, they're, they're what tend to be used for the raster. We don't want to resample those or transform them because that's a very lossy operation with raster. Um, there's not really time to go into it, but you have to like choose a new value for the pixels. All the pixels are in different places, so they end up introducing a lot of error when you do that. So what we can do instead, we also don't necessarily know when we load this thing, what CRS it's going to be in. It depends where it is in the world. So what we can do, here's our grid coverage with a specific CRS. We can create a grid coverage with CRS holder for that that has the existential type in it. So now we say our rules are still here, but now we're trying to hide the rules so it's easier to use, right? So now we say, okay, I'm going to read in some grid coverage. I don't know what the CRS is, but I can tell you that it's going to be some type that I invent, and here's the implicit for that type. And now you can import that, again, uh, where I use it, which is the next one. You can import that coverage, coverage CRS, and then you can use uh, that as a type in your system. So we, we have our CRS loaded, it's in 32615. We have some coordinates that are in 32616. This can really happen because these um, satellite images often overlap edges of CRSs. This won't compile, but if we transform it to the coverage CRS, that type, it will compile and it will be in the correct CRS. So we've, again, we've just saved ourselves having a field in the middle of Lake Erie. Okay, and this is just a, a kind of a, uh, refinement of that. Maybe we don't want to have to make you go transform this thing. Maybe we can just say, I can crop to a polygon in any CRS I want. So here's the polygon CRS, here's the coverage CRS. Transform that coverage, that poly CRS to the coverage CRS, and now we can crop it. So, you know, it's just building up the abstraction layers. And once you get the idea that there's no difference between a type that you define and a type that you just invent, as long as it satisfies the implicit constraints. This is all the same stuff, right? This could be EPSG32615, but it's not. It's one that we just created, and it has the information it needs to, to use it. All right. Um, I don't know if there's going to really be time to do this. Uh, I'm just going to skip straight to the chase here. There is a idea that... Um, Chris Voigt, who I don't think is at the conference, sadly. I think it was Chris. I'm like 95% certain it was Chris that showed me this many years ago. And I promptly ignored it for about six, seven years. And then I came across it attributes again. And I'm like, oh, you know, a type map might be interesting for that. So we get all these um, kind of loosely associated attributes on features on things in uh, GIS data that, you know, like a uh, a yield, like a crop yield for a field, and a planting density for a field, and they're all kind of numbers and things like that. And they end up going into a map of string to any, because, you know, we have no shame. That is apparently what works, and so we'll stick with it. But we can do a lot better than that with Scala. So if you, if you use these type index maps, you can do, and some, uh, some fancy footwork with type tags. This code is all open source, so you can go and look at it afterwards, and kind of absorb it. What you can achieve is something like this. So you can create a T-map, okay, T-map of 10. T-map is sort of like if anyone's used HList out of um, Shapeless. A T-map can be thought of roughly as analogous to uh, what an HList is, H is to a list, a T-map is to a map, okay. It, it's a map that has the type information tracked in it, like an HList has the type information tracked in it. So if we create a tmap of 10, this actually becomes a tmap of int, okay, because that's what's in there. The, the 10 is the value, the key is the type, which is 10. If we add something to it, this is just the plus method that I put, and I put a string in there, this widens out the definition, or narrows the definition, I guess. It does an intersection type, and it says, this is now an int with a string, because it's got both of those things in there. If I add something else, like an, a list of int, we end up with int with string with list of int. This is how we do loose, loose but statically typed attribute tracing in uh, the libraries that we use. So uh, that didn't move on, did it? Uh, 
yeah, what you can do is things like this. So I'm not going to go deeply into this code because there's not time. But what this lets you do is something along these lines. Here's a calculate yield at the top. It says, I'll take any Tmap as long as there's a flow and a duration in there. And I can produce a yield from that. Down here, we've got a Tmap that has a field name with a flow, with a duration. Because of covariance, this is a subtype of that. So we can call calc yield with it. And the result will be a yield. We can add that back in. And now we end up with this Tmap gets big. The type gets big, if you do enough of this. But that's the price you pay. So you end up with field name with flow with duration with yield in it. And we can't call this with something like uh, feature with yield 2, which is defined up there somewhere. And that's because feature with yield 2 only has a field name. It doesn't have a flow and a duration. So you will get a compile time error when you try and do that. OK, this, there's just not time for this. I was going to go into why the, the rich um, extension method. but. Uh, you'll have to, this, this talk is available online, so if you're curious as to that, you can find it on the Scala days. Um, the, rich, the rich wrapper gets around a problem where you can't use equals colon equals because the covariance rules are different from the invariance rules that equals colon equals requires. You can use a less than colon less than, but when you do that, it infers nothing. Uh, because of the variance. So if you introduce a rich implicit, a wrapped implicit, it lets you freeze the type first and then go ahead and call the less than colon less than version. So it gets around a problem with type inference, basically, is the, is the trick there. OK, so that's pretty much it. I think I'm out of time, but I will take any questions that anybody has. Um, this work was done for a company that I work for called SIBO. I'm a full-time employee there as well as doing the Escalate stuff. Uh, we are sort of hiring, so you know, give us a look. Uh, it, we work a lot with Scala. We do a lot of this kind of stuff with Scala. And uh, my CEO role is a training company called Escalate Software. Uh, if you liked this, uh, check out our courses. We will come and do them for you. And there's Udemy courses online as well. And it will teach you, the advanced courses will teach you all of this stuff and more. So, all right, uh, that's it. Have I got time for questions? Yeah? Um, yes? When you convert from one type to another, um, and it's an existential type, where does the implicit come from, from that type? Good question. Um, let me, uh, I, I realize it was very rushed, so let me see if I can find that. Oh. Uh, so in that existential, oh, I have a lot of slides. Uh, no, too far. Existential, here. This is the implicit. Um, it's our responsibility when we create this thing to supply that implicit. So up here, you see that implicit val? It's a pure abstract. It needs to be filled in. We have to supply some kind of definition for it, and that will be down here. Okay, it is necessary to do a cast at this point. I didn't, I didn't um, point it out, but as I mentioned, casting is not your enemy. You just need to know when to use it properly. The Scala type system does not exist outside of the Scala compiler. Therefore, if you want to bring something from the outside world into the Scala type system, you have to do a cast. There will be a cast somewhere. It may be hidden, it may be cleverly abstracted out behind some other kind of method, but ultimately there's some kind of cast going on because you can't invent a type for something that's coming from the outside world without casting. So this is where that, C that CRS is found. It's, you know, here it's looked up. Down here, we create the type and we set up the implicit. And once we've got those two things, that's a valid type with a companion, with a, a type class that we can import. And when we import some CRS, it brings the type and its implicit into scope. So they can be used just like any other one then. So yeah, that's really kind of the crux of the talk. So I'm glad if that helped people understand. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm also a huge fan of the uh typing colors. Uh, did you find that really helpful in terms of thinking about this uh, code that manipulates a lot of like 
Yeah, I, I like my color scheme. It's available publicly. It's actually based on one that Bold Radius did, and I did some tweaking to. Um, I turn all of my vars red, for example, so they look like errors. That's one of the. That's one of the things I do. It's actually not a compilation thing, but it's like a little poke. Hey, you're using a var. You really shouldn't be. Um, so yeah, that's available on. Um, I'll, I'll send an email to Alexi or something, and people can get like the. Because the, the slides and the code for this are on GitHub, and I'll, if people like that color scheme, I'll make that available as well. I think I'm getting, this, I'm getting the nod that that's it. So uh, thank you anyway, and I hope this was useful, even if it was a bit hard.